All right, here we are, Revelation and Daniel. Daniel, Revelation, uh, we're at lesson number nine. I'd want you to open your Bibles to chapter 12 of Revelation. That's where we'll be um, reading at the, appropriate, uh, at the appropriate time, and we'll be throwing up the slides uh, as well. So we know that Revelation is the vision that John the Apostle has concerning the church's struggle with Rome, which took place in the first century. Uh, the theme of the book is the revelation of Christ, a more perfect vision in His glorified state. The idea is that the, the Gospels uh, give us a vision of Christ in His humbled state. In other words, He's a man, He has to eat, He's hungry, He gets tired, even uh, is uh, frustrated by the disbelief of His uh, followers uh, at times. And you know, for a few moments, a few glorified moments, we see Him um, you know, performing a miracle, certainly His resurrection, but those are you know, moments of glory that go through uh, the, uh, the Gospels. But when we get to the book of Revelation, uh, John shows us his exalted state. No, no humility here, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's not being attacked by man, uh, no limits if you wish. Uh, he is in his glorified, glorified state. So, Let's, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, at the scene. You know, we need to keep the story in order uh, because there's so many symbols and you know, so much uh, figurative language. Uh, we kind of lose the story at times. So, so far we've, uh, we've seen the glorious vision of Christ as He speaks to John at the very beginning of the book. Then we hear Christ's instructions uh, to the seven churches uh, in order to be faithful, that's part of uh, vision one that uh, John describes beginning in chapter one, goes all the way to chapter three. Then we watched as John describes the theme of God and the scene as Christ begins a display of His power, uh, the power that's at His command that will be used to destroy the enemy. Remember I talked to you about the idea that it was uh, like a parade, you know, you know, military parades, a little bit like a military parade, one thing after another, demonstrating all the powers that, um, that the Lord is going to use against His enemy. Then we've also heard the prophecy as to the events that will take place that will lead to the ultimate victory uh, of the church. And so the events you know, will, uh, will take place in the following manner. The church will grow rapidly. Then there will be a period of persecution where the church, uh, it will seem, uh, has lost. Uh, then it will survive this uh, persecution and ultimately uh, be victorious as the enemy is, uh, is defeated. So that's the story that uh, John is telling here uh, with many of his visions. Now, all the information, these images, these symbols have been presented in the second vision and that lasts from chapter four all the way over to chapter 11. So as we begin studying today, we're going to look at the third vision as John describes the actual struggle. So you know, we had the kind of the preliminary, if you wish, the parade, the power, the things that are going to happen. Now he describes the actual struggle itself. And first he introduces Christ, and then there is the viewing of His power. Now there's going to be kind of a play-by-play -play of the struggle itself. Now we need to remember that when John is writing this particular book, the persecution by Rome has already begun. I mean, it's not something that's happening in the future. It's something that they're actually experiencing in the, in the now. And so what he is writing informs the church of the first century concerning their immediate and future struggle. Uh, so in this way, it is prophecy. You know, some, sometimes uh, people talk about Revelation in the sense that it's all prophecy. It's only about you know, the future, the end of the world. But there is some um, reference, if you will, uh, to the things that will take place at the end of the world. But as far as John is concerned and the people in the first century, uh, these things were happening now and the prophecy contained in the book simply referred to something that would happen in the not too distant future, the ultimate destruction of the uh, Roman Empire. And um, uh, you know, even though it only happened a few hundred years after John was writing, uh, it was still a major uh, prophecy. And that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to get across uh, in this lesson, that yes, it's prophecy, but it's prophecy concerning the immediate struggle that they were, 
uh, experiencing at that time and how it would end in the near future. Now we read it today and we see that that prophecy was fulfilled. I mean, Rome did fall, the church did survive. However, the book prophesizes that this cycle of evil, all right, uh, and struggle will continue and one day Jesus will return to put an end to this and open the new heavens and the new earth. So uh, he's talking about what's happening to them uh, as they were experiencing it. He also makes a prophecy in the short term that the Roman Empire will ultimately be destroyed. And he also uh, demonstrates an ongoing cycle that will take place throughout history. The cycle of evil, uh, you know, different empires, different philosophies, ideas, so on and so forth, that will continue until the end of time, when at the very end of time, Jesus will return and put an end to that uh, cycle once and for all. And so in this sense, it's prophecy for us today. Our encouragement is that if the former prophecies were fulfilled concerning Rome, well then we can have confidence that the prophecies for the end of the world will also be fulfilled, uh, things that we look forward to uh, in our day. So let's take a look at vision number three, that would be in chapter 12. Now the bulk of the vision is the actual description of the struggle between Satan and his earthly embodiment, which was Rome and the Lord Jesus and His earthly embodiment, which is the church. So John's going to describe the war between these two, jumping from images of Satan and Rome and Jesus and the church, and he'll also describe the tactics uh, that each used to destroy the other. So let's read um, chapter 12, beginning in verse one. It says, a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. So here we have the introduction of the woman, and the woman, of course, is the ideal of God's people in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and she gives birth to the child. Of course, it's, um, you know, it's not too hard to figure out who the child is. The child is Christ, the product of God's people in the Old Testament and New Testament, brought about by a long and painful history. So it says the woman is, you know, is in labor. Well, you know, throughout history, the Jewish nation, it was in labor, if you wish. It had all kinds of persecutions and failings and so on and so forth, wars, they were overrun, they were put into exile. The long period of labor throughout history to get to a point where the Christ was actually born. So John kind of compresses this whole idea and just gives it one word, labor, until the child is born. Then he says in verse three, then another sign appeared in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. So the red dragon represents Satan. Uh, the seven heads, world domination. The ten horns, complete destructive power. The seven crowns, not victory, but symbolizing rule. Remember the numbers that we've talked about, number seven, you know, a number that is complete, number 10, uh, a mature, a dominating number, always using these numbers to demonstrate the uh, extent of the power, the extent of the domination, uh, the extent of the corruption. We keep reading verse four. It says, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And so again, a lot of symbolism here. The sweeping of the stars represents the killing of God's people, including the attempt to destroy the Christ child. I mean, uh, this child is prepared to rule, you know, with an iron, you know, the idea, an iron rule, meaning a rule that can't be broken, a rule with all the power that it requires. And it says the wilderness. The wilderness, of course, is the earth, not heaven. And the 1260 days we know represents a short time. 
You remember in, even in Daniel, it talked about a long time, short. So the 1260 days represents a short time. Now we're not going to read verses 12 to 17, we're going to skip over that. Just the idea in verses 7 to 17, John is going to describe the scene in which we see Satan's four-step attack in order to destroy Jesus and His church. So the first step, uh, uh, he tries to attack the child. In other words, attempts to keep him from being born or surviving once he is born. And we see that all the way through the Bible, don't we? I mean, you know, every attempt that Satan makes uh, to try to uh, destroy God's people, to uh, seduce kings, to uh, not believe or to disobey, uh, the temptation in the garden of Jesus, and, and so on and so forth. All of these throughout history are the attacks against the birth of the child in one way uh, or another. The second attack uh, is the throne in heaven. Uh, Satan begins a spiritual war in an effort to keep Christ from bringing his blood to the to the throne so that he can continue to accuse man of sin. Uh, but John describes that the lamb eventually does come to the throne to bring the blood of the sacrifice. And the gospel is being spread, thus taking away his power and having him thrown down. So the war is in two spheres. The war is here on earth, of course, that we know more about because we can read it historically, but the war is also in the spiritual places. You know, Paul talks about that in Ephesians, that our, our, our battle is not flesh and blood, but our battle is against the spirits and the dominions and the powers and the rulers that live in the spiritual world. So here, you know, uh, John through his vision gives us an idea about the battle that is taking place there. And the, and the essence of the battle is Satan's attempt to stop either the sacrifice or Christ being born or making a sacrifice or to stop in heaven him from bringing the sacrifice uh, to the throne of God. A third attack is the attack of the woman. Uh, the woman is given wings, we read about. Uh, wings are a symbol of protection. Uh, Satan sends rivers of wickedness, but the earth, uh, he says, the earth drinks it up. And the idea there is that uh, lies and wickedness, false religion, all these things are sent to target the church. The woman represents the church also. But she resists these. She remains faithful. But the world, meaning non-believers, they drink in the things to their own, uh, to their own destruction. The woman symbolically gives birth to Christians and is afforded protection. The woman is at the same time spiritual Israel or God's people throughout history. So that symbol of the woman you know, uh, pertains to many different facets of God's people throughout history, but always the same idea, God's people. Uh, Satan sending things to attack God's people. And God's people, if they're faithful, they resist these things. But those who are unbelievers, they fall victim to these type of attacks. And so an attack against God's people to stop them from multiplying. And one of the attacks that the church was experiencing at that time was the persecution by Rome. Remember, Rome was trying to destroy the church. Okay? Uh, we know that that attack fails and the wickedness sent uh, does not affect the church, but it does affect the rest of the world. And then the fourth attack that Satan makes, um, the fourth attack that he makes is he attacks individuals within the church. Now, in this he is successful because individuals have free choice. Some are destroyed. Some Christians fall away. Some Christians uh, lose their faith. And so we go to chapter uh, 13. And in chapter 13, the description of the struggle continues as agents are brought in to help defeat the seed or the offering of the woman. So you see what's happening, right? John, is, in his vision, is telling this story, describes the great creature Satan, you know, the red dragon, uh, with all his power. He describes the various ways that the dragon has attacked uh, the church, Christ, and so on and so forth to try to stop the work of uh, the redemption of Christ through the cross. Okay, he talks about that. And then in chapter 13, new characters come onto the stage. The red, you know, the devil, the red dragon, uh, he, he brings in some uh, replacements, okay, replacements, uh, soldiers, some new individuals uh, in the scenario. 
And uh, here John's vision gets much more specific as to the description of the embodiment of Satan, namely the Roman Empire. And so in this chapter he begins symbolically to describe the enemy, which is Rome, which is the embodiment of Satan. So in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 13, again we're not going to read that passage, I'm just going to uh, you know, uh, paraphrase it for you. And I do remind you to read ahead. You know, I, I've said before, we're not going to have time to read all of the verses, so make sure you read ahead so that when I get to those particular sections, you're familiar with the material that's in the book. So in verses one to 10, he describes the first beast. All right, so the red dragon you know, brings in reinforcements. And one of those reinforcements, an ally of Satan in the war against the church. So the first beast is red, has 10 horns, seven heads, 10 crowns, looks something like Satan in the previous chapter, but here is the embodiment of Satan. So the first creature that is described by John is Satan himself. The second creature, the beast, is an embodiment of Satan on the earth. And so the embodiment of Satan on the earth, as John is describing now in chapter 13, is Rome itself. And so the beast represents Rome. So let's take a look at the description. Red, of course, is evil and violence. Ten horns, the absolute temporal power that Rome had. Ten crowns uh, refer to the absolute temporal rulership. Rome ruled supreme. Uh, there was no challenger uh, to its uh, rulership at that time in the world. Uh, seven heads could be either the seven mountains around Rome, could also refer to seven kings or seven emperors. You know, uh, any of the imagery uh, fits. Now, in, 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 uh, in chapter 13, John says that one of the heads was wounded and then came back to life. And sometimes you know, we, today we wonder, what does that mean? Uh, but the people who lived at that time, they knew what that meant. You see, at that time there was a, a rumor that went around called Nero's resurrection. Um, and I'll, let me explain that to you. There were actually eight emperors from Augustus in 14 AD to Domitian in 96 AD, when this book was probably written. However, one of them is like a resurrection of the previous one. As I said, there was a rumor in Rome that Nero would resurrect and come back, and when future persecutions began after Nero's death, it was said that it was Nero's spirit dwelling and guiding the present emperor in the persecution. Thus, seven real emperors and one in the spirit of a past emperor. And so today, you know, we have to get that, we have to kind of understand that, read between the lines, so to speak. But in the first century, they were familiar with the idea. They, you know, they got it. They understood what John was referring to. So now, if we continue the action, the dragon gives rulership over to this first beast, okay, who has uh, existing power at the writing of the book. So this beast resembles a composite of the four beasts in Daniel, and John shows it to be a terrible beast, just like Daniel's fourth beast. Remember all the four, you know, the four beasts that Daniel talked about? Remember I said it was important that we understood what that represented? Well, here we see a kind of a mirror image of that in the book of Revelation. Again, don't get lost now, in the, uh, you know, don't get lost in all the, the symbols. The first creature is Satan, the dragon, he brings in a reinforcement called the beast, looks somewhat like Satan, but represents the Roman uh, Empire. Um, the beast, this is the work that the beast will do, uh, the beast will blaspheme God and receive worship itself as God. Now we understand, historically we understand to mean emperor worship. And so John says that this beast will do damage for a while, three and a half years, he says and it has the authority to do so. In other words, God will permit. Remember I've told you in other lessons that nothing happens without God's permission. Sometimes the things that are happen are good and wonderful and positive, you know, and we say, oh, we've received a blessing from God. Sometimes we have a car accident and we, you know, we break our arm. Well, God didn't send that, but He permitted it because nothing happens without God's permission. And so what John is saying here is, this beast is going to do what he's going to do. 
You know, no use can I, you know, hoping that it won't happen. He's saying you know, this beast is going to do what it's going to do. God will permit it for a time. Now the beautiful thing about being a Christian, of course, is when we look at these things, we understand that even the evil things that God will permit for a time, those people will be judged. Now if there was no judgment, if, if, if people did whatever they did and there was no, judge, no judgment of these things, then it would be chaos and we would be sorely discouraged. But we know that God will call every single individual into account for what they've done. That goes from the simplest individual who has a small life and a family and does his life quietly to the greatest king or president that ever lived. Everybody will be judged. So John is saying, you know, this beast is going to do a lot of damage for a time. God permits it, but there's going to be a judgment. Okay? So the point is that there's no use resisting or losing hope. The beast will do its damage, but only for a short while. All right, so verses 11 to 18, uh, John is going to introduce a second character or agent of Satan, now is called forth, another, you know, uh, another recruit, and this one is called the false prophet. Okay? Now the purpose of the false prophet is to influence the people to give worship to the first beast. Okay? And so the description, um, this false prophet has horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. And so the lamb, uh, the idea of the lamb represents religion, the idea of dragon represents evil. Um, um, uh, and so if you, if you combine uh, religion and the dragon, what you have is false religion. Okay? So he tries to influence worship of the beast. In other words, the false prophet uses a variety of tactics to get the people to worship, not the devil now, not the first creature, but the beast, all right? So he uses three different methods that John will describe here. First, magic and sorcery, to seduce the people into thinking that the beast has some power, so on and so forth. Secondly, economic sanctions the mark of the beast. Those who worshiped received a certain identification mark that allowed them to trade. Now that's a very historical idea. You know, today, you know, if you want to build a shed in the back of your house or an extension, you have to go to City Hall, you have to get a permit, so on and so forth. And that's normal, that's how the, you know, that's how the government raises tax money and, and maintains a certain amount of uh, uh, continuity, if you wish, uh, in, in the building code. But in those days, you had to have a seal to do anything, to trade money, to have a business, to do any type of bartering, trading, business, anything at all, you had to have uh, the imperial seal. And that was based on your uh, faithful um, attendance to emperor worship. You had to buy into emperor worship in order to get uh, the seal. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then the, so the third tactic was threats of violence. Those who refused the emperor worship uh, were put to death. Now, he talks about the false prophet and that he can be recognized by his number, and his number is 666, all right? We've seen that in so many movies and all kinds, 666, and it's all so mysterious. But you know, we, we, we've studied Jewish numerology, right? And we know that the number six represents incompleteness, something that is not complete. Number seven represents something that is complete. Number six is something that is incomplete. So if you have six and six and six, three sixes in a row, you're talking about something that is woefully incomplete and that will never be complete, all right? A total imperfection. That's what number 666. Another interesting thing is that the Jews had a way of equating numbers to the alphabet and the number uh, 666 is the uh, numerical equivalent to the word Nero Caesar. And so John used this kind of riddle for his Jewish and Greek Christian audience. They understood who 666 was. It was referring to Nero, the false prophet, the emperor worship, if you wish. So the false prophet also corresponds historically to what were called the Asiarchs. These were priests of the cult of emperor worship who promoted this practice throughout the provinces using occult and magic. Uh, so far in this vision, 
uh, John has described the following things. Okay, so we need to regroup and summarize here. All right, number one, he describes God's power in defeating the enemy. Number two, he describes the battle itself and the enemy itself. We see the child is born. He's attacked by Satan in a variety of ways. He's taken to heaven. We see the blood of Christ is operational and the persecution of the church begins, will only last three and a half years, which means a short time. We see that Satan is cast out of heaven and begins to use two beasts to persecute the seed, which is the offspring or, the, or Christians themselves. And then we see that these will be, uh, or there will be rather, a period of intense persecution. And so the next chapter, or in the next chapter, John is going to describe the defeat and the judgment of the beasts and Satan. So we go to, we go to chapter 14. All right. So now in chapter 14 is the announcement of the final judgment, and it's divided into three sections. Now the final judgment, right? I mean, we've had the play-by-play -play of the war. It's not some big, long, you know, they did this, they did that. It's just a short description of what takes place, the attack of the church, some of the methodologies used to attack the church, and the characters that Satan uh, is using in, in that attack. And John goes directly to the judgment now, and he, he, he shows the judgment in three sections, the 144,000, uh, the three angels, and the two sickles. You know what a sickle is, you know, that uh, very uh, ancient uh, device uh, to harvest. All right. So, We've seen the action of Satan's attack. We've seen his forces. Now the judgment on him and these will be pronounced. In other words, we see God's counterattack. And so let's read chapter 14. Uh, briefly, we'll read verse one to five. It says, um, Then I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the uh, uh, four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. And so we've already discussed the 144,000 and the significance of the 144,000. You know, the 144,000, that perfect number of those with whom God deals with, basically, is what it means. Um, uh, the ones that he has sealed, the ones that he has protected, the ones that he has counted, the ones that he has measured, you know, are now shown to have survived the persecution and the attacks of Satan. Remember, in the Bible, the writers a lot of times describe the same thing in many different ways. So who are the sealed? Oh, who are the measured ones? Who are the protected ones? Who are the 144,000? Who are the saints? Well, it's, we're always talking about the same people. We're, we're, we're talking about Christians, we're, we're talking about God's people. So it's true for the first century, as well as every subsequent uh, attack and persecution, including death itself. You know, God protects His own in one way or another, depending on the, um, uh, not depending, but in various situations throughout history. So those who are gods in Christ will be saved. So who are the 144,000? Well, they're the saved. That's who they are. They're the saved. They're the, they were the saved then and they're the saved now, today. And in the future, the 144,000 will always be the saved. And so in verses 6 to 13, uh, three angels appear. So the judgment, remember I said the judgment is being pronounced? Well, the first, first aspect of the judgment is um, there are some who are saved and obviously some who are going to be lost. So who are the saved? Well, they're 144,000. He could have said, they're the saints. He could have said, they're the sealed. He could have said, there are those that I've measured and kept. He could have said it in a lot of different ways, but he calls them the 144,000. That's us, we're the 144,000. So the judgment is, some are saved, the ones God has saved. Therefore, it doesn't say it, but therefore some are lost. Second judgment, the three angels. 
The first angel brings the gospel and signifies judgment is at hand. It's coming. God is going to judge. The second angel announces the fall of Babylon. Babylon, remember I said? Some things are described in a variety of ways. Well, this time Babylon is the word used to describe Rome. We know that Babylon was the center for wickedness and idolatry and a world power in the ancient days, hundreds of years before Rome. Now Rome is that world power, wicked and uh, full of idolatry and persecution for the church. And so uh, John calls Rome Babylon. Uh, so the second angel says the judgment is at hand. Third, third angel announces the destruction of those who partake of the beast. Who are they? Well, they're not 144,000. Who are they? Well, they're, the, they're Rome and the followers of Rome. Um, he talks about drinking the wine of wrath. Well, what do you think that could be? Well, judgment, you know, the outcome of following those who are evil. So you know, he contrasts between those who receive the mark of the beast, all right, who accept and embrace Rome, and he compares those who have uh, uh, received the sealing of the Spirit, the 144,000. One of them is going to suffer judgment and then torment and suffering. The other have been persecuted but will now have joy and rest. All right, verses 14 to 20, the third image, the image of the two sickles. All right, this is the image of judgment after the destruction of the beast and its followers. Um, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus judges first and His judgment is to reap the harvest of His followers who will be with Him. And who do you think they are? Well, they're the 144,000. We always go back to that, that same group that's been described in a variety of ways. And then the other angel of judgment comes and he gathers those who are unbelievers and sinners and their judgment will be suffering. Have we ever seen an image of judgment any different than this anywhere throughout the Bible? I mean, even though the imagery you know, is mysterious and it's heavenly and so on and so forth, every image of judgment is always the same. Those who follow God or Christ, you know, they're saved, they're described in a variety of ways, but their outcome is always the same, joy, peace, love, eternal life. And those who didn't believe, those who were wicked, well, their end is what? Well, it's judgment and suffering. So it's no different here. So the beast is destroyed, the followers are punished, the earth is judged with good rewarded and evil rejected and punished. All right, so John describes the battle between Satan and his forces and Jesus and his church. In chapter 14, the final destruction and judgment is described. So in the following chapters, John is going to digress and he's going to give more detail concerning the destruction of Rome and the final dealing that God will have with Satan himself who started all of this. You know, you ever watch those movies? You know, the girl is trapped and she's, uh, she's tied up somewhere, you know, and the hero, he's, he's coming to save his beloved, right? And he's fighting guys, he's the guards at the door, he dispatches them with you know, two, three uh, swipes of the sword and then he beats up the guy who's on the inside. You know, he keeps fighting his way through the crowd and the, the war is going on, people fighting all around him. We know what's going to happen. How many times have we seen that movie? And he finally gets to the chamber where, the, where, the, where, the, you know, where the, his, his beloved is tied up and then the main guy, the main bad guy is there and that's the climactic battle. And we say, wow, where did they get the idea for this? <laughs> well, they, for a lot of it, they got it right here because that's exactly what John is describing. You know, the battles going back and forth and you know, the, the small fry, the, the, the small bad guys are being dispatched and judged and then at the end, you know, the hero and the, and, and the villain, uh, the, the climactic scene. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen here. The beast is judged, the false prophet is judged, the followers, you know, the small fry, you know, they'll be judged. You know. So now there's only one guy left, that's Satan. And there's only one guy left on the other side, and that's Christ. And so we get the final battle between the two top guys. And uh, John is going to describe that uh, himself um, in the next couple of chapters. So you hang on for that. 
Uh, as I've said to you before, make sure you read ahead so that we can kind of go through the material without having to read every chapter. So that's it for now. We'll see you next time as we study Daniel Revelation for beginners.